everybody, and welcome to our two-part webinar series where we are going to discover the exciting world of hyaluronic acid and NIMU's new hydration range or rehydration range. And joining me all the way in Wales is Vicky Convey. Good morning, Vicky, and welcome to our webinar. It seems like a long time since we've done one of these before. It is morning. Yes, definitely, Heidi. I couldn't even tell you the last one, but I'm excited all about hydration, eager to learn more. Fantastic. And yes, this is going to be a new launch um, that is coming next year in 2020. But we want to be able to give you some information in preparation of the launch of these um, three new products that will be coming out. So yes, today what we are going to be focusing on is looking at the hyaluronic acid molecule. How is it formed? What is the importance of hyaluronic acid? Where we as NIMU has used it before? And that will then lead us and prepare us into our next part two webinar, which will be actually all about the new hyaluronic acid ingredients and the product itself. So lots of exciting information, and I'm sure you are as excited as I am to have some new products joining the NIMU um, brand. So today, we are going to be introduced to the three products. You're going to get a little glimpse of them before we touch on it in our next presentation. And as I mentioned, we are going to look at hyaluronic acid. And we call it the moisture miracle molecule because it really is that molecule that is responsible for the moisture in the skin, that is responsible for the volume, for the plumpness in the skin. And it really is a miracle molecule because of everything that it is responsible for within the skin. Um, and that is why we call it the moisture miracle molecule. So I saw this in a presentation on one of our raw materials and they said, what is the commonality between hydration in the skin and the little black dress? So Vicky, can you tell me what do you think these two have in common? Gosh. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, if I think of a little black, black dress, I would probably think of it's your, your go-to, um, you know, you can't go wrong with a little black dress. Good. I think you're really on track there. I know they look so <laughs> completely different, but yes, your they are both a basic and a timeless essential. So as you said, your go-to with a lot of problems within the skin, sometimes it's just looking at the hydration levels within the skin. So it is your go-to. Um, so definitely it is important that it is part of the basics in how we approach in treating the skin. And hydration is always going to be there or the need for hydration is always going to be there. And I think especially looking at um, what causes dehydration in the skin with the environment that we're living in and our lifestyles, our hydration levels is taking a big beating. So we need to be able to be equipped and provide solutions to our clients in terms of maintaining the hydration levels within the skin. When we did consumer research or when we look at Mintel consumer research, there is a very strong indication that dry and dehydrated skin is a big common concern. Um, and that spreads across most of the continents that we actually get our market research from. And it is something that consumers still is requesting and requiring it as a solution in their skincare products. So, Typically, where we would experience dry and dehydrated skin is during seasonal um, climate changes. So you are going through, um, going into winter. So of course, it's going to be lots of central heating. 
it's going to be very dry and cold outside. And similarly, in the Southern Hemisphere, we're going to be having dry, hot summers. So when there is a seasonal change, we do see that the skin's natural moisture levels are affected. And again, we need to be able to um, have a solution in that. And we, the, what consumers are looking for is um, a solution for dry and dehydrated skin. And they want hydration to be a benefit from their skincare products. Now, as a brand, NIMU, we continuously look at new active raw ingredients. And um, I know I've mentioned it in previous presentations that we do attend raw material conferences. Um, we have people from the different raw material suppliers globally that comes to our head office and they do presentations on wonderful, amazing new raw uh, material um, ingredients. But not only that, looking at new ingredients, we also want to see what innovation lies around existing ingredients. And I remember sitting in the first um, visit from a raw material supplier and they spoke about hyaluronic acid in general. And then they spoke about, wow, this is what we do have and this is what we can achieve with new hydration lines with our new hydration um, molecules, hyaluronic acid molecules. So it's not just looking at new and exciting ingredients, but it's also looking at innovation around existing ingredients. So of course, with that innovation around existing ingredients, it's allowing us to be able to access new innovative forms of hyaluronic acid. Um, and that is going to provide us with new advantages, which is going to be able to allow us to create new products around that innovative um, ingredients. So we want to still continue to achieve skin health. And we can do this with a new hydro concept that is providing us with unique smart technology, um, within hyaluronic acid, and it's going to really amplify our natural hydration levels within the skin. So that is just a little bit in a nutshell why we are choosing this route of creating a hydration range is that we've got this amazing new um, innovative forms of hyaluronic acid, and we are able to now improve the skin's natural hyaluronic acid with this new and advanced forms of hyaluronic acid. So yes, we want to change the approach to anti-aging and that is what we are going to be focusing on within the next two webinars. And introducing our three new hyaluronic acid products. There is the Hyaluronic Ultra Filler Serum. There is the Hyaluronic Oil and there is the hyaluronic acid superfluid. What do you think of those, Vicky? Love them. I love the booster, the color. Yeah. Fantastic. And um, I have had the chance to try them. So uh, I'm uh, really excited to, to get my hands on them officially <laughs> instead <laughs> of just a little, a little tester, a little but, taste. <laughs> and yes, um, I mean, with us at head office, we have been able to experience some of the products and it is, it's fantastic in terms of um, textures. So there's the sensorial aspect, there's the, um, you know, clinical evidence in how the skin is changing. Um, and I think this is really going to be a game changer in terms of treating hydration within the skin. So who is it for? Um, any of our consumers may uh, use the hyaluronic acid products um, from the age of 20 upwards. Um, it can be used for all skin classifications, apart from the oil that we would suggest for problematic skin. It may be, um, you know, a little bit too much in terms of oil texture for their skin. Excellent, obviously, for your dry and dehydrated skin conditions. And then, of course, if you think of the skin being dry and dehydrated, typically it's going to look tired, it's going to look dull, it's going to look lifeless. So those skin um, conditions is what is 
a big focus on for the rehydration products. So basically anybody can incorporate it. And also um, with both the oil and the serum, it is also good to incorporate into your program should a client be going through the transitional period. It is also going to take them through the period much quicker. So let's have a look at the moisture miracle molecule, hyaluronic acid. Where did it start? Where, when was it discovered? And how was it formed within the skin? And what are the different forms of hyaluronic acids, the benefits of hyaluronic acid within the skin? So hyaluronic acid was initially discovered by two scientists in the 1900s. And they looked at the vitreous humor of a cow. We all have vitreous humors in our eyes, and that is the jelly-like substance behind what we see initially within our eye. And they looked at what is um, the constituents of this vitreous humor, and they discovered that there were two acids. One of them was uronic acid, and then, of course, they combined it with the word hyalos, which is the Greek meaning of glassy appearance. And that is actually where the word hyaluronic acid came about. So it is the glassy appearance and, of course, that uronic acid that comes in. So it is also um, a glassy appearance, as we said. It is actually the most abundant glycaminoglycan that you will find in the dermis. It is the main component that we will find in our extracellular matrix. So that is that jelly-like fluid in which our fibroblasts, our collagen, our elastin is actually immersed in. It is a fantastic water binding. It has the most um, unique uh, capacity to bind water. And we call it a humectant because it actually is able to draw water towards it. And that in turn creates that plumped, um, volumizing effect within the skin. And it also helps to keep and hold water molecules within the skin. So that's a little bit um, as to what hyaluronic acid is all about. So just a few fun facts with hyaluronic acid, as we said, it was first discovered in the early 1900s. The total amount of hyaluronic acid in the adult body is about 15 grams. So that's quite a bit of hyaluronic acid. If you think of everything else that mm -hmm. is within our body, hyaluronic acid is quite a, a large proportion of um, the total weight. 50% of hyaluronic acid is found in the skin. So the other 50% is spread in a lot of other parts of the body, um, in our organs, but 50% is found in the largest organ, which is the skin. A third of the skin hyaluronic acid degrades every single day. Now, you know, Vicky, with cell turnover, from the time a keratinocyte becomes a dead skin cell that is actually desquamating, we know that that cell cycle is about 28 days but the hyaluronic acid turnover is 24 hours, one day, and then it's gone. So the important thing is that it needs to be replaced on a daily basis. Um, and if it's not replaced, you know, within that time period, that is where dehydration um, sets in. And then of course, if we allow that to remain within the skin, then of course it's aging and loss of volume and plumpness, etc. So it is a very important, um, it's very important that we do provide um, the skin with the ability to replace that on a daily basis. Now there's a big word there, hydrophilic, it's water loving. That's basically what it is. And because it loves water, it wants to hold onto water and it's able to retain um, or hold up to a thousand times its own weight in water. And that's a lot. So that is where that plumping, volumizing benefit comes in. And yes, naturally, we can actually, um, you know, provide substitution of hyaluronic acid from 
root vegetables, soya products are high in hyaluronic acid, leafy greens, so your kales, your spinach, um, and then broths. Broths is very big um, in South Africa. I don't know if it's big also in the UK, but your um, animal broths, um, because obviously it's, it's high in connective tissue, your animal bones, and that then provides the skin with hyaluronic acid. So um, yes, there are sources, um, internal sources that you can actually use to get your hyaluronic acid. Any fun facts that you know, perhaps, Vicky, on hyaluronic acid? No, I just always remember back in the college days, to be honest, I don't think we spoke about hyaluronic acid so much, but dehydration was a huge area, uh, subject area. And I think just living in Europe, you know, you're very aware that dehydration is probably the, one of the major concerns that clients have. So not a fun fact, but just something I think that we, we learn about very, very early. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So when we, where would we find hyaluronic acid? Naturally, as we said, it's in the body, um, in the vitreous humor. Interesting is the umbilical cord has a high percentage of hyaluronic acid. So that little baby in the uterus is holding on, that umbilical cord is holding on to a lot of hyaluronic acid. That's why they have that beautiful plump skin when they come out. Um, synovial fluid, that is the cushioning between your um, bones, that joint area. So when there's a creaking of joints, it probably means also the synovial fluid and the hyaluronic acid in that area is possibly depleted. And then of course, also in your organs, your lungs, your liver, um, those are also areas where you would find hyaluronic acid. And then, of course, as we said, 50% would be found within the skin. Um, just touching on what the functions of hyaluronic acid is in the body, it, as we said, is lubrication of your joints. So lack of hyaluronic acid means your, your um, joints, your bones are then grinding against each other, which is obviously becoming uncomfortable. It is a space filler in certain areas, um, for example, like we said, the eye area. Um, it provides the framework for blood vessel formation, and it is essential as a medium through which your cells are able to migrate. So, for example, um, I know we're referring to the skin here, but how your fibroblasts are able to move upwards through the dermis, they need a medium, and that is hyaluronic acid, your gags. Um, which is there. Now in the skin, we find that the content of hyaluronic acid is actually higher in the dermis than the epidermis. Um, again, because it's that cushioning, because it's that medium for migration. And then taking it one step further, the papillary dermis has a higher content of hyaluronic acid compared to your reticular dermis. If you think of in your papillary dermis, your collagen fibers, your elastin fibers is less loosely, um, you can say it's less compacted in that area. So there's more space in which we would have hyaluronic acid versus your reticular dermis where it's more dense in collagen and um, elastin fibers. Your connective tissue is more dense. So there's less areas in which we would find hyaluronic acid. Right, so your epidermal hyaluronic acid, you'll find it mostly situation, situated in um, around the stratum granulosum area. And if you think of that particular area, it is where the cells are starting to lose keratin. It's starting to um, create um, your corneocytes moving upwards. So it is actually responsible for barrier protection. So that's why it's, um, you know, maintaining your water within the skin. So it's minimizing transepidermal water loss. And it's able to also pull water from the dermis because that's where your uh, more water is more abundant. Um, and of course, because it's lying higher up within the skin, we find that hyaluronic acid here is uh, more of a larger molecule. So it's a higher molecular weight therefore situated more closely to the surface of the skin. Now, funny, I've always, sorry, I've always thought of it as being in the dermis 
and never ever thought about the epidermis. Do you know, I think we, you know, we get taught, especially at NIMU about the, the brick wall and, you know, the water content, but never even, you know, thought about hyaluronic acid being part of that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, definitely hyaluronic acid is a big part of, um, you know, being part of your barrier. So it's not just your biolipids, it's the water that's there as well. Um, yeah. And then, of course, you know, with your dermal hyaluronic acid, that is then providing the support for your connective tissue. It also helps to regulate the balance of water within the skin. And then again, it is able to be the source of your hyaluronic acid for your epidermis. And that's why also the importance of cellular communication is absolutely essential because the better the cells are able to communicate, the better also the transfer of hyaluronic acid between dermis and epidermis. Um, and because it is situated deeper down within the skin, it has a lower molecular weight. Mm -hmm. So um, it is able to be, you know, focusing deeper down within the skin. Mm -hmm. Now, this was actually quite interesting that I know you shared with me, Vicky, but, um, you know, a few questions that uh, therapists will have is that it's an acid, but we haven't touched on that as an alpha hydroxy acid, or is it an acid that can actually exfoliate the skin? So no, it is very different to your, um, you know, your proteolytic acids, your glycolic, your uh, lactic acids. It actually has that exfoliating um, effect within the skin. Does not exfoliate the, uh, the skin at all, but it works on providing the skin with moisture um, and hydration. It is just the name hyaluronic acid. Mm -hmm. And then the other point that came up is, okay, so it's been around for ages. Why is it such a popular ingredient today? Why do we see it in so many products out there? And I think, you know, when we touch on our um, product itself, we obviously would be getting the questions of how does this compare with this product, hyaluronic acid-based product. And um, yes, it is a very popular ingredient, but again, because it is addressing dehydration. And we said in the beginning that it is one of the big concerns that clients have and one of their requests from a skincare brand. What can I do to treat my dehydration? And we know that if we allow dehydration to remain within the skin, it is one of the first signs of aging. So if we don't target dehydration, we may also accelerate the aging process. Um, again, because we now linked it to the barrier, if we have client having sensitivity and redness in the skin, it possibly is because the hydration levels and the hyaluronic acid levels within the skin is lower, meaning the barrier is impaired. So everything is starting to now tie in together. And it's a wonderful, gentle, active ingredient that can be used for all skin conditions. So right from your problematic skin condition to your client that has hypersensitivity, it's a great all-rounder ingredient to treat the skin. And they always, you know, we always say, let's focus on hydrating the skin and so many other skin conditions can then be treated just yeah. by targeting dehydration. So where does it all begin? And now I know when I put this together, um, you know, and we, we discussed it as an education team, it was like, wow, you know, this is not what we discussed in college. You know, we just touched on hyaluronic acid itself, but there's a whole new world out there in terms of how it is formed, where it's formed, how it breaks down. And that is so important because when we look at the ingredients, you are going to see the importance of understanding this information. So we need to know that it is synthesized um, within the skin cell itself, or at least that's where the start of it is. Um, and that is by what we call the hyaluronic acid synthases. And it's an enzyme. And this is, we see it on the inside of your cell membrane. So we know that the cell has a double membrane, double plasma membrane. 
and on the inside of your plasma membrane, which is situated inside the cells, this is where we actually find this hyaluronic acid synthases. And it is actually stimulated by um, various processes, but particularly growth factors, um, cytokines, which is your inflammatory um, responses. So let's say, for example, you wound the skin, um, you injure the skin in some way, your growth factors get stimulated, your cytokines get stimulated so that it sends a message, your white blood cells target that area to start the healing process. So if we think of doing a peel or doing microneedling, that's an injury. And you know that we always say, once you've had a peel, your skin feels hydrated and plumper. You do microneedling, your skin feels hydrated and plumper. And that's also because we've stimulated hyaluronic acid as well as collagen within the skin. So that is creating an addition of hyaluronic acid within the skin. Now, it's seen that your epidermal hyaluronic acid may come from your keratinocytes and your dermal hyaluronic acid may come from your fibroblasts. Those are cells. And of course, they have those double membranes. So those can come from um, you know, those particular cells. And again, um, just to reiterate the importance of having a healthy skin to be able to have the right um, amount of hyaluronic acid. So if your health of your keratinocytes is not good or the health of your fibroblasts is not good, it's going to then affect the production of your hyaluronic acid. Right, so the hyaluronic acid, where does it all begin? Where does it all start? And this is the interesting thing is that hyaluronic acid itself, it's the most simplest form of glycoaminoglycans. It's not complicated in structure at all. It's just two sugar molecules repeating itself to form this particular strand of sugar molecule, which is your hyaluronic acid. So what it is, it is your two sugar molecules, which is D-glucuronic acid and N-acetyl-D-glucosamine. And they then, they form together linked by bonds and that is forming your hyaluronic acid. So it's just a succession of D-glucuronic and N-acetyl-D-glucosamine, simple sugar molecule. Now, how it actually forms as a molecule chain is that you have these particular uh, precursors, these sugar molecules inside your cell. They then go together through your hyaluronic acid synthases, which stimulates the production of your hyaluronic acid. It moves through this little channel of your plasma membrane and out comes your hyaluronic acid molecule. So that's actually very interesting because just two molecules together goes through a little channel together with your synthases, it now forms a chain, which is your hyaluronic acid. And I have another visual which actually shows how it is forming. So you have it on the inside of your cell membrane. It goes through this protein that is a little channel in your cell membrane and out comes your hyaluronic acid molecule. So we could say that would be like the fibroblast cell. And then obviously it's then excreted out of the fibroblast cell once it's gone through the two sugar molecules binding together and then out comes out pops your hyaluronic acid <laughs> absolutely yes um yeah. and then also the same with keratinocytes it's exactly the same um same keratinocyte cells it's got your synthases it's got the two precursors they go through the channel and out pops your hyaluronic acid Right, so the main functions in the skin, it's responsible for cell growth and migration. Um, it's important for cellular communication. Um, it also is a great protection um, against reactive oxygen species. It does also play a big role in the repair of skin 
um, with any damage. So whether it be controlled wounding or actually uncontrolled wounding. And then importantly is it is there to provide hydration and moisture, which is depleted as a result of intrinsic and extrinsic aging. And that is what we're going to um, look at and just touch on so that we understand when we start talking about the active ingredients. Um, we understand the concept of aging, touching on that again, and also dehydration within the skin. So look at a young skin. If you look at the left hand side, there's a nice um, amount of hyaluronic acid. It is a great um, providing the volume in the skin. We're not really going to see much fine lines and wrinkles, but if we compare it to an aging skin, we can actually see that there's a lack of hyaluronic acid, a lack of volume, a lack of moisture within the skin. And that in turn is going to lead to a little crevice, which is going to be a, uh, our lines and wrinkles. Okay, so there are two processes that we need to look at when we focus on aging. There is your natural chronological or um, what we call your intrinsic aging. And if we're referring specifically to hyaluronic acid, um, as we get older, naturally, your hyaluronic acid starts degrading. And that is where we do see the lack of volume, the lack of plumpness, and the lines and wrinkles. And then also as we age, your skin's natural antioxidant defenses also start decreasing. So the skin is not able to fight against free radicals which is then also going to prematurely age the skin, damage the lipids within the skin, your skin DNA, and of course your, your barrier. Now, looking at extrinsic aging, these are um, the effects of the outside environment, um, you know, climatic conditions, heat on the skin. And also when the skin is exposed to the extrinsic um, factors, there's going to be an increase in reactive oxygen stress on the skin. And this in turn causes an increase in your matrix metallinoproteinases. And that is the enzymes that breaks down your proteins. So that is an increase in your collagenase enzyme, which breaks down collagen. And I always say it's like a lock and key fit. So your collagenase will break down your collagen protein. Elastase will break down your elastin protein, and then hyaluronidase breaks down your hyaluronic acid molecules. So this is a great example. If we look at um, extrinsic factors, these are twins that have the same genetic uh, material passed into, uh, through them. Twin A on the left-hand side, the skin is aging, we know it is going to be your um, chronological aging, but have a look at twin B. You can see that her aging is completely different. There is age spots, there's lines and wrinkles, there's sagging on the skin, and that is as a result of external factors creating um, premature aging and accelerating the aging process within her skin. So, We've looked at intrinsic and extrinsic factors causing aging, but now there's also um, what is happening when the skin is exposed to pollution and light. So Vicky, what do you think is happening to the skin when there is a effect with UV and with pollution? I think obviously nowadays um, we, we're living in more sort of cities. Pollution is a hot topic. It's in the news all the time, especially with global warming and things like that. And I think the fact that when you, you have a mix of the pollution, so let's just say the car fumes and the UV light mixing together, then that's naturally going to age the skin. And we've also seen and research has showed us that it increases pigmentation as well. Mm. And um, I know from, from looking at studies when it comes to hyaluronic acid and protecting your skin and aging, there's a, a particular protein which is called sequestazone, which is an expression protein. And they've seen that 
when you're faced with this pollution and particularly with UV, which we are in 365 days a year, that it's naturally going to decrease. So if your skin does not have this protection against the UV and pollution, you've got the added degrading of hyaluronic acid on that, which as you said, is gonna to lead to the lines and wrinkles, the aging, the dullness, the sallowness. Mm -hmm. Um, so it plays a huge part, I think, that something we probably didn't know about years ago. Exactly. And of course, I mean, Vicky, your skin has a natural way of protecting itself. Mm -hmm. It's your cell protection, a self protection mechanism within the skin. And unfortunately, this has been affected by the environment in which we live. So added UV, added pollution. And that's actually preventing the skin from doing what it should, which is yeah. protecting itself. So, of course, this sequestrosome is decreasing um, and getting less. So the skin is not able to do what it's supposed to. And I think this is very important to remember because when we look at the ingredients later, we're going to come back to this and see how we can help the skin to function the way it's supposed to um, and protect itself even better. So, of course, you know, besides... Um, you know, intrinsic and extrinsic aging, if we think particularly on um, the effects of certain things. So for example, ROS, it is causing an increase in those enzymes that we said. And the enzyme that we're particularly looking at um, that is causing a decrease in hyaluronic acid is your hyaluronidase. And what is also happening is there is a decrease in collagen and elastin synthesis within the skin. So we are aging faster. Um, and then we're losing water very rapidly. There's a decrease in hyaluronic acid because of what we spoke about, um, the different factors. Um, the length of your hyaluronic acid molecule is shortening, okay? So it's not providing that intense hydration. And of course, with less moisture, it's going to lead to less dehydration. And there I have my little grape becoming a little shriveled up little raisin um, as time goes by. And that's what's happening to your skin cells. It's you know, losing its moisture. It's losing its protection um, in terms of helping to provide barrier protection. And of course, that's going to lead to a lot of problems later. And then... How it all ends, besides all of that that we just spoke about, but hyaluronic acid molecule, there is that MMP, which is hyaluronidase, which I spoke about. And that is a particular enzyme that we found, find in the dermis and the epidermis. And what it does, this enzyme locks with your hyaluronic acid and it causes a breakdown of that hyaluronic acid chain. And the more you expose your skin to UV, the more that hyaluronic acid, um, your hyaluronidase is going to break down your hyaluronic acid. And that is why, you know, you go on a summer holiday and you get some sun rays and, you know, you see the skin actually almost looks very shriveled up. Besides yeah. the darkness, the redness, but it looks very shriveled up. And that's because you've actually broken down your skin's hyaluronic acid. And that is because you produced too much hyaluronidase, which is now breaking down your hyaluronic acid. And then of course, with ROS, which is a big factor for breaking down hyaluronic acid, because ROS is you know, your free radicals. And it inc an increase in ROS is going to also break down hyaluronic acid. And I've got a little visual you can actually see um, the long blue chains is your good, healthy hyaluronic acid mm -hmm. molecules. And when that hyaluronidase enzyme is stepping in, it starts breaking down your hyaluronic acid molecule into shorter, um, smaller chains, which is not going to give the skin the moisture that it essentially needs. So just a, a quick recap. If you have an increase in ROS um, as a result of extra, uh, your chronological or extrinsic aging. If you have a decrease in that protein, as we said, that sequestrosome, 
if we have an increase in your MMPs, you're going to have a loss of hyaluronic acid. You're going to have a breakdown in that extracellular matrix in which your collagen, your elastin, um, your fibroblasts are actually immersed in. And what is going to happen on the surface of the skin? You're going to have skin sagging. The loss of, there's a loss of suppleness. The skin is going to lose that firmness. There's going to be a loss of volume, um, density. You know, you see sometimes as, um, you know, people naturally age, their skin seems to form quite hollows, um, mm -hmm. you know, around the eyes, around the cheeks. Um, and of course, in turn also, there'll be lines and wrinkles um, that is then going to get deeper and deeper over time. So this is what's happening in the skin. But now what is it going to look like on the surface? You know, it's all fair and well to see that, but this is what we've seen. Dehydration, fine lines and wrinkles, dryness, the barrier is going to be decreased. As we said, that association between moisture and the barrier. And then of course, a loss of volume and plumpness. And because we are looking at this range of products as a solution for dehydration and dryness, these are the two areas that we're going to essentially um, look at. Now, dry skin and dehydrated skin, you know, we, we get very confused because, you know, sometimes it almost looks the same, but it is actually um, quite different. Um, Dehydration, you know, when you pull the skin together or you stretch the skin, you can actually see those tiny crisscross lines within the skin. Whereas dryness, it actually looks more embedded in the skin, so to speak. Yeah. So what is the difference? If you have a dry skin, um, it is more genetic type that you are born with. Um, it means that your sebaceous glands is not producing enough oils, so your skin is lacking in oil. Um, and sometimes that's a little bit more difficult to uh, repair through whether it be diet or whether it be um, topical. It's easier to actually replace water than actually replacing oils. The skin may feel more rough. Um, it will look more dry and parched, like a desert, just lacking in um, nutrients. Um, and it is more permanent. Whereas a dehydrated appearance is more of a condition. It is more temporary. It is easier to treat, uh, treat dehydration through correct product application and through um, you know, altering diet. And that is when there's a lack of water in your stratum corneum. When you, let's say, wash the skin, the skin may appear and feel tight. Um, you may see fine lines developing. And if we do not address dehydration immediately, it's going to create deeper lines uh, over time. And so we see that as a lack of hydration, whereas dryness is a lack of moisture or nourishment in the skin. But there are similarities in that both can result in very flaky um, skin sensitivity, um, dullness. You know, if you're dry or dehydrated, the skin can appear lifeless and dull and just, you know, nothing, no radiance, no glow. And also, you know, if there's sensitivity, if there's irritation, it can actually become uncomfortable and also itchiness um, can also be as a result. Um, and obviously, inevitably, that can lead to premature aging. Um, and we said, you know, aging is a fact of life, but looking your age is not. Um, you know, a lot of people want to age gracefully or they will do the extremes to avoid uh, looking their age. But again, as a brand, we want to be able to treat the skin in a as natural way as possible. Um, and that is where we're going to provide our solutions for that. So, what do you think the solutions are, Vicky? Gosh, I don't know. I, I hear so many nowadays, to be honest. I think um, people tend to go for the quick fix. Yeah. So, I hear a lot about, you know, the injectables, um, uh, 
topical as well, you know, people using different products and things, but I, I think it's the injectables that's gone quite big within our industry. Absolutely. So let's have a look at some of the solutions is your non-surgical cosmetic um, procedure. So where no surgery intervention is required, but it is still, um, you know, injectables. So these are your botulinum toxins where you actually soften the lines and wrinkles that's already developed because of expression. Um, and then of course, there's your other groups, which is seen as your fillers, which is your calcium hydroxyl appetite, your poly L lactic acid, and then of course your injectable hyaluronic acid. These are um, you know, materials that is used which is going to reduce the lack of volume. It's going to create a plumping effect. So they would typically use it around the eye area, the nasolabial fold, where there is um, a lack of um, density within the skin. It could be due to illness. It could be due to natural, uh, natural loss of hyaluronic acid. It could be due to... Um, all sorts, uh, you know, your environment. So those are more your quick fixes where it can be, you need it, you know, it can be done between six months, um, redone every six months or sometimes up to two years in the case of your poly L lactic acid. Um, so yes, it adds shape, structure, volume. It lasts six, to, six months to one year, but there are some side effects and complications. So let's look at some of them. It, it's expensive. Not everybody is going to be able to afford going for those more quick fixes. Um, there are some clinical complications. Um, there'll be bleeding. There'll be bruising. Um, there's actually been known to sometimes have a loss of tissue. If you go into blood tissue, you can actually cause necrosis where the cells actually die off. And then what they have to do is they actually have to then take hyaluronidase and mm. inject that into the skin to break down that that they've injected into the skin. Mm. And then if we think of NIMU's philosophy, with these quick fixes, yes, there's always a place for it. And clients will still go for it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be um, a solution for many of our customers. But we have to just remember that it does not restore the barrier and it does not create any functional or structural changes within the skin. So yes, there'll be some clients that would still have the injectables, but again, we would need to provide a solution to them in terms of let's help to improve the barrier so we don't further lose water within the skin. Let's help to allow your skin to function as it should. Let's change the functional capabilities of the skin, which will in turn help to improve the structure of the skin. So these are just a few um, current solutions um, in terms of injectables. So we've looked at the injectables, but obviously we need to be able to have an alternative solution and that would be your topical um, ingredient, uh, hyaluronic acid as a topical ingredient. Now, hyaluronic acid on its own as an ingredient, um, it is not able to actually be used in a formulation because of the nature and the size of the molecule. So we would use the salt um, derivative of hyaluronic acid. So you will always see sodium hyaluronate one or two um, because that is the only way in which we can use hyaluronic acid as a molecule in a topical formulation. But hyaluronic acid in a topical, uh, whether it be a cream or a gel uh, or serum, it is able to bind up to a thousand times its own weight in water. And then, of course, the benefits to the skin, it does depend on the molecular weight. So the higher molecular weight will be more focusing on the surface in the stratum corneum because it's a bigger molecule and the lower molecular weight will be more smaller molecule that is able to focus um, deeper into the skin. So the major difference is the length also and the weight of the hyaluronic acid itself. So if we think of hyaluronic acid to water, 
Um, you can say it's a ratio of one to a thousand. So as we said, it's able to hold a thousand times its own weight in water. And we always talk about the molecular weight. Is it a low molecular weight or is it a high molecular weight? So we said the lower penetrates deeper and the higher molecular weight has more of a superficial penetration into the skin. So just to keep that in mind again, as we talk about our various hyaluronic acid molecules, which we do have already and which we are introducing in our new range. So cross-linked hyaluronic acid. This is sodium hyaluronate cross polymer one. I think we just need to remember it as cross-linked hyaluronic acid. This is um, a great ingredient in terms of being a higher molecular weight. It is actually able to form a film within this on the surface of the skin. So it is able to build up on the barrier of the skin and also keep moisture in. So it helps to prevent transepidermal water loss. Very good also for hydrating and moisturizing within the skin. So not just hydration, but also keeping in, um, preventing the skin from breaking the barrier uh, down. Then your high molecular weight hyaluronic acid, that's also um, sodium hyaluronate three. Because it's a higher molecular weight, it's forming a film on the skin. And this is what you'd say is your immediate plumping action um, that we would have on the surface of the skin. Great for moisturizing. And again, because you are, you know, protecting the skin and the surface, it prevents irritation within the skin. So great for a product that is targeting um, sensitivity, irritation, you'll find a higher molecular weight in, um, of hyaluronic acid in there as well. Then your low molecular weight hyaluronic acid, as you can see in the visual, it is going deeper down into the skin. Uh, particular penetrating lower down into your, um, through the stratum corneum. It is able to bind with water, attracting water into the skin cells. It also is a great, um, you know, protection against oxidative stress. So overall, um, because it's working lower, it is able to provide superior moisturization within the skin. Right, so we've just looked at all the different types of hyaluronic acid that um, we currently have and what we know of. But Vicky, let's see if you can remember a few products that NIMU has that already has these molecules of hyaluronic acid. Can you remember? Gosh, probably one that always sticks in my mind is the professional hyaluronic acid gel. Um, I think just the way it feels, you described the cross-linked hyaluronic acid. And I think when you feel it, you can almost feel that it, it's formed that film on the skin. So that would definitely be one that I always remember. Yeah. Uh, our day preparations, moisturizers, um, you know, thinking multi-day, multi-night, um, yeah. being that richer consistency. I know when I first started NIMU, that was my go-to straight away. <laughs> <laughs> I need the hydration constantly. And, um, you know, your mask as well. Excellent. Um, hydrating mask. Have I, have I named them all? <laughs> I think you've got them almost all there. Well done, Vicky. So, yes, um, you know, if we think of environmentally damaged skin conditions, they need both, uh, you know, nourishment, the moisture, the barrier prepare, uh, repair, as well as the hydration. So, Nimunite, multi-day plus, multi-night plus, there we'll find hyaluronic acid. In our um, super hydrating mask for retail and professional, obviously it is the same, you will find um, hyaluronic acid. And then, yes, in our professional hyaluronic acid gel, that is excellent um, and must be used during microneedling. And as you said, it forms that film over the skin. So you are helping to seal the channels that you've just created but also it is working through all the different layers with cross-linked hyaluronic acid, low molecular weight and high molecular weight hyaluronic acid to give the skin that good boost of moisture and water that it's absolutely, that it's essentially looking for. So that is what we currently have, but it's not going to stop here. There are some amazing new 
innovative forms of hyaluronic acid. And unfortunately, we're not going to touch on that now. We will go into part two where we'll look at the incredible um, benefits that more advanced hyaluronic acid can have for the skin and looking at the products in which we um, have now placed them that is going to take hydration or at least treating dehydration, treating dryness, it's going to take it to the next level. So I'm very excited to share that in the next webinar. Um, and yes, that is for now. And Vicky, anything further from your side? No, I mean, that was great, Heidi. I think it's, um, it's good to, to really go in depth into hyaluronic acid. Uh, I think it's an area that we never really have spent much time going into at NIMU and understanding the importance of the acid. So it's good to, to refresh and um, to go into more details and understand how it's formed and how it's degraded and, um, you know, look into what's available in the future and all the exciting things to come. So thank you. It's a pleasure. So yes, until next time, thank you for joining us and I look forward to sharing further information. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.